Hi, everybody. This is the last lecture in the evolution lecture series. And I just want to wrap up um, some final ideas about the relationship between natural selection, adaptations, evolution, and try to give you that last veneer of sophistication that you need to have a, a good conversation about this topic and to make it easier for when you get to those upper level biology classes when you transfer to Stony Brook University. I'll be happy to see you there. Let's see. So in the last lecture, I told you that we define evolution as a change in a population's gene frequency over time. And I gave the example that if an airplane full of people from uh, one country that um, has a very um, um, stylized look to them, like the Finnish people who are blonde and blue eyes or Nigerian who are dark skin, dark hair, dark eyes. We bring them to some place that's homogenized like Long Island, or if we took people from Nigeria and brought them to Sweden or people from Sweden and brought them to Nigeria, we are changing a population's gene frequency, right? Because we went from being mostly blonde people to an influx of dark people, or a majority of dark people with an influx of light people. And that is evolution right there. Um, so when you talk to people and they're like, oh, I don't believe in evolution, you have to point out that it's just a change in gene frequency over time. And probably what they're really complaining about is um, the idea that evolution can lead to adaptations and adaptations can lead to speciation. And that speciation leads to the diversity of life we see on this planet. And that adaptations lead to really sophisticated things like eyeballs and hearts and I don't know, you know, even kidneys. Okay, so let's talk a minute about the relationship between natural selection and evolution. It is a real easy mistake to make to equate them in your head, to say that evolution and natural selection and sexual selection are the same thing, but that is not exactly true. Let's explore that idea just a little bit. Um, so if you look at this 13, um, if we look at these badly drawn mice and actually ignore the mice, ignore the mice. Cause I don't want to do, I don't, you don't need to do math for this. Let's, let's go. On. Um, so let's not do the math, but let's think about the mice right here. We have 13 of 30 alleles. Okay, so I have to explain to you what an allele is. Um, if we are talking in the public, when we talk about genes, and even throughout this lecture, I've been talking about genes. Most of the time when I'm talking about genes, what I really mean is alleles. Uh, and um, I've been trying to um, keep it easy and accessible. So I haven't really talked about the difference between genes and alleles, but you guys are ready for this conversation about the difference between genes and alleles right now. Okay, everybody's eye has a color. There is a gene that codes for eye color, but whether you have brown eyes or green eyes is going to depend on which alleles you have. So in these mice right here, right here, we've got this is the gene with one allele here and one allele here. And we can see that this white mouse has two white alleles. This black mouse has two black alleles. And this black mouse has one white allele and one black allele. Okay, so the gene codes for mouse color. The alleles are what color you end up being. So in this particular case, I just put this off the net. I did not draw these mice. Um, in this particular case, if you are a black mouse, you could have one allele for white coat and one allele for black coat. And if you have both white and black, you turn out black. If you have white and white, you turn out white. And if you have black, if you have one black allele and another black allele, you turn out black. Okay, so. If we counted, if we took this whole population of mice and we looked at 
uh, and we counted up the alleles and we say that we have 13 um, are white. Okay, well, in this particular case, this should be not white, but black. Um, what's the, okay, I'm speaking Klingon and I'm not helping. Let me help you. So we've got this population of mice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 mice. 15 mice. And I randomly kill three of them. I have changed the gene frequency because whatever alleles they had at the gene for coat color, it's gone. Is that evolution? I changed the gene frequency over time. I killed three mice. Yes, that's evolution because they changed gene frequency. But it's not necessarily natural selection. Natural selection would occur. See if you could figure out what natural, how natural selection would occur. You'll know by the end of the lecture, and I'm, but I'm not gonna tell you yet. See if you can tell the difference between evolution and natural selection. I killed three random mice. I changed the gene frequency. Is that natural selection? Okay, I'm gonna have scribbles on all of my slides. That's just for your special entertainment. Okay, so if I have random changes in the gene frequency over time, I went and killed three random mice for no good reason. Then we call that genetic drift. Random changes in the genetic makeup of the population is defined as genetic drift. So if we've got this, these beetles on a sidewalk and most of the beetles are brown and three of them are green. And some person in wingtip shoes just walks through and pays no attention to the beetles and just steps on two of the three green ones. That's change in gene frequency over time. And it's gonna actually change the population pretty dramatically because it's gonna go from, oh, let's say 70%, oh crap. Um, it's gonna go from 70% brown um, to, 90% brown, just because this guy walked through and didn't look where he was stepping. That is genetic drift. Genetic drift is random, so it doesn't generate adaptations. In that example that I talked about with the mice where I randomly killed three mice, I changed the gene frequency, but I wasn't picking the mice on purpose. I wasn't picking the black ones or the white ones. Like if I was going through and killing all the white mice, then that would be directional. And it could lead on purpose to mice who were all black. It could lead to an adaptation for black furred mice. But since I just picked random mice, I wasn't generating an adaptation. I'm like the guy with the wingtip shoes walking down the sidewalk. Okay, genetic drift is random. Genetic drift does not generate adaptations. Okay, let's look at another way to generate evolution, which is called the founder effect. Okay, here is an example of the founder effect. Let's say that we are in Greenport at the end of Long Island, and we're looking at the ladybugs, and we see that the ladybug population in Greenport is as likely to be red as yellow. We, let's say we collect 20 ladybugs and 11 of them are red and nine of them are yellow. And then we go over to Shelter Island. We take the little mini ferry and we enjoy the sunshine and the sparkles on the water. And we go over to Shelter Island and we collect a whole bunch of ladybugs. Then we see that all the ladybugs on Shelter Island are red. We might be mistaken to think, oh, I wonder what the adaptation is that makes Shelter Island a better environment for red ladybugs instead of yellow ladybugs. Okay, you might be thinking about adaptations. Why are yellow ladybugs selected against on Shelter Island? You would be wrong because the reason that one, re you might be wrong. One reason that the ladybugs on Shelter Island could be red, could be because during the last big windstorm, 
um, a whole bunch of just random um, red ladybugs were brought over from Greenport to Shelter Island. Just random luck, because they only blew over seven ladybugs, just happened to be seven red ones. It could happen. So that means that when Shelter Island was colonized by ladybugs, it was colonized by primarily red ladybugs. And so it isn't that yellow ladybugs aren't suited to Shelter Island. It could just be that the red ones got there and habitated the place and made it their own. We call that the founder effect. Now that is a kind of evolution, okay? But it doesn't generate adaptations. It's just random luck. Um, it could have been yellow ladybugs that got blown over in the storm, or it could have been a mix of, of, of ladybugs that got blown over in the storm. They all would have done equally fine. The color doesn't matter in that particular place. So you're not going to generate adaptations. So genetic drift is random, and it's just a random change in gene frequency over sheer luck. It does not generate adaptations. Founder effect, also kind of random, but it's who starts a population. And a lot of times who starts a population is depending on the weather or luck. So no adaptations. What's our third choice here? Selection. Okay, we spent all of the semester so far talking about selection. Selection pressure where you have variation in ladybug color, you have a heritability component, the color that a ladybug is depends on its, its genes and the alleles that code, code for the color of its chitin, and you have selection. Maybe red ladybugs are selected in particular environments, or maybe yellow ladybugs are selected for in particular environments, okay? So and I want to make the point here that selection can include Unnatural selection, which is domestication, where humans are picking a trait that they're selecting for or against. So if we're picking for the cows that make the most milk, we're selecting for milk production. If we're selecting for chickens that lay the most eggs and we're, we're selecting for egg production, we can have natural selection, where selection is um, favoring cattle that can live in um, low water scenarios, so drought resistant cattle. And we can have sexual selection where the, where the female cows are picking the bulls that have the biggest horns or the most colorful fur. That'd be weird for cows, they don't actually do that. Okay, but we already know that selection generates adaptation. So let's keep going with the kind of examples we've been giving. We've got these, the same beetles that we saw with the wingtip shoes in the sidewalk scenario. But this time, instead of just randomly stepping on particular um, um, beetles, we've got crows who love to eat green beetles and they don't like to eat orange beetles. So we've got this population that's primarily green and we've got the crows that are eating the green beetles. What's gonna, and we let these, let's say that some beetles survive this and they reproduce and they have babies. What's the population of beetles going to look like in the next generation? It's going to be more orange than it is now because the crows are selecting against the green ones. Okay, so first generation, you can see it went from mostly green to maybe 50-50 here, um, oops, to mostly orange over here. So natural selection is a non-random change in gene frequency over time. Okay, I have to be clear, like I wrote this to be accessible, but if you wanna be fancy, um, what you wanna say is that natural selection is a non-random change in allele frequency over time. Okay. So we have three really common ways to generate um, evolution. We have three common ways to generate gene changes in gene frequency over time. We've got genetic drift, which is random. We've got the founder effect, which is random. And we've got natural selection or unnatural selection or sexual selection, one flavor of selection. And that can generate adaptations. Okay, so I just wanted to give you this example. This is an actual photo. Um, beetles have evolved to avoid birds. <laughs> it's not just made up. Um, it's not a crow, but nonetheless. Okay, um, the last thing that I wanna say here is that Evolution equals selection, right? Evol evolution also equals the founder effect. Evolution also equals genetic drift. But selection does not equal evolution. Um, 
So natural selection is one form of evolution. That's the take home message that I want you to understand. Natural selection is one of three kinds of evolution. Okay. So if people say, I don't believe in evolution, you can say, mm, really, can you explain that? Because how can you not believe in genetic drift? Random changes in gene frequency over time, that is evolution. Okay, so if people say they don't believe in natural selection, well, it's really hard not to believe in natural selection if you just look at our farm animals, because our farm animals have been selected for over time by humans. Um, you know, we have the sheep with the nicest wool and the nicest meat and different kinds of sheep breeds. We have cows that are good for meat versus cows that are good for milk. We have chickens that are good for meat versus chickens that are good for eggs. And humans have driven those differences. Okay, dog breeds. Humans, before the Victorian era, era there were no dog breeds. Humans drove dog breed selection, right? It's not like chihuahuas are particularly suited to a particular environment that drove chihuahuaness. Um, humans drove chihuahuaness. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this lecture series and I will see you guys later.